Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Active Inference live stream. It is Active Inference live stream 14.1 on January 19th, 2021. Welcome to the Active Inference Lab, everyone. We are an experiment in online team communication, learning, and practice related to Active Inference. I'm going to share my screen for the participants. You can find us at our website, on Twitter, Gmail, YouTube, or our public Keybase team or shared username. This is a recorded and an archived live stream, so please provide us with feedback so that we can improve on our work. And whether in the live chat or the comments, just feel free to share whatever you're thinking. All backgrounds and perspectives are welcome here. And as far as video etiquette for live streams, we'll mute if there's noise in our background, raise our hands so that we can hear from everybody who wants to share and use respectful speech behavior. So for the Active Inference live streams in 2021, we're going to be having these regular Tuesday, 7 a.m. Pacific times. And then we're also going to be having these special sessions like the model stream and several other kinds of events that we're really excited to be planning. And go to this big red link and you'll find a spreadsheet. And in that spreadsheet, you'll find the details on past and present and upcoming Active Inference live streams. Here we are in 14.1 discussing the math is not the territory with author Mel Andrews. Next week, we're going to be discussing the same paper for a follow-up paper, and then we're moving on to a different paper. But for this week and for next week, we're going to be in this awesome paper and this awesome group of discussants. Today in ActImp Stream 14, we're going to have introductions and warm-ups. Then in the sections of 14.1, we're going to be going through the paper, the math is not the territory, Navigating the Free Energy Principle by Mel Andrews in October 2020. And we have some slides with aims and claims, abstract, roadmap, etc. But this is pretty much going to be whatever people want to discuss today and whatever questions we want to address in next week as well. So if you have any questions, just save them and submit them however you can and get in touch if you want to join live. Okay, awesome. So Let's start with the introductions, and we'll just give a short introduction or check-in and then pass to somebody who hasn't spoken yet. And especially if it's your first time, we would love to hear what your background or interest in active inference is. So I'm Daniel. I'm a postdoctoral researcher in California, and I will pass first to Mel. Hi there. Um, I'm Mel Andrews, and uh, I think for better or for worse, my uh, doctoral work is going to end up being largely about the free energy principle and active inference. So that's why I'm here. Cool. Pass it to somebody who can then introduce themselves. Marco. Hi there. Thank you, Mel. Um, hi, my name is Marco. Uh, I'm from Holland. Uh, my background's in psychology and cognitive neuroscience, and during my master's, also worked a bit on the energy principle. Uh, and my interest in active inference is, um, well, a multitude of things. I, I, just, I just believe it, it really has a potential, uh, as alluded to and, and written about by Mel uh, in, in the paper we're discussing today. Uh, in general, just a lot of potential to understand a lot of aspects of the world and society that we so far haven't been able to really grasp with alternative models. So happy to be here. Then pass to and I'll pass it to Ivan. Hi, my name is Ivan. I'm from Moscow, Russia. I'm a researcher in system uh, school. I'm, uh, I'm an engineer, a system engineer. And I pass it to um, Shannon. Hey, guys. I'm Shannon. And I'm... Um, uh, working in uh, cognition, I do brain stimulation, and I'm also interested in social cognition and how we interact, um, like in a musical ensemble, and how the free energy principle applies to both scales of those questions. And um, I'll pass it to Alex. Alex, we can't hear you. Distant X, Alex. Um, but you don't appear muted. Let's go to Alex. Hello. Oh, yep. Now we hear you. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Alex, uh, and uh, I'm in Moscow, Russia, and I'm a researcher in systems management school. 
and trying to find a way to find integration between active inference and system engineering approaches. And I pass it to Alex Kiefer. OK, thanks. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Alex. I'm Alex. Um, I'm interested in, uh, I, I'm a philosopher, I guess, uh, interested in free energy principle and active inference and sort of fun fundamental questions about mental representation. And lately, I've been more uh, interested in applied work and sort of um, combining, eventually maybe combining um, these approaches with other approaches to machine learning, and so active inference as like a technology. But um, I will pass it on to, um, let's see, uh, Dave. Oh, Dave, you muted. So we have Dave, and then we have also then the last remaining there we go. Tim, Stephen, Dave. and Philip. Uh, Dave Douglas, I'm retired from information technology, live in the Philippines. My background is in cybernetics and uh, machine translation. I'm teaching myself neuropsychoanalysis, and I was so pleased to come to Mel's paper because I've been trying to figure out what is this thing after all? It's like a a metaphor among metaphors among metaphors, and maybe uh, you can tell us toward the end of the presentation whether that has anything to do with what you what you're saying in your paper. And I can't even see who else has not spoken. Uh, Philippe, Philippe, there we go. Hi, I'm Philip. Uh, I'm studying theoretical biology in Prague, uh, and I'm interested in computational neuroscience. And I joined because I only read Mel's paper and I found it interesting, but I don't know anything about it. Perfect. Um, let's go to Tim. Hi, I'm Tim. Uh, I'm in Toronto, Canada. Uh, it's my first time joining in the, the sessions. Um, really eager to learn about this stuff. So it's really fascinating. Uh, my background is in <laughs> science and engineering, uh, specifically, I guess, electronic systems and software. And uh, that kind of thing. Yeah. And I'll, I'll pass to Stephen. Go for it, Stephen, or fellow Jitser. Okay, and Sarah, have you gone? Hi, I'm uh, Sarah Davis. I'm um, in Berlin and. Um, Right now, I'm a master's student in philosophy of science, but before that, I was an artist. And the through line, I guess, that's interesting to me is um, the relationship between information and materials and media. So I'm interested in like reservoir computing and how how and when you can separate those things and in, in you know what is life, like all these funny things that are circling around that. So active inference is just yet another useful thing that um, I want to understand better because it seems to connect to a lot of other disciplines. Um, Stephen and I know each other through the Terence Deacon circle. We're, we're big Terence Deacon fans. Cool. It'll be interesting to hear about that soon. And then I see Blue or yes. Hi, good morning. I'm Blue Knight. I'm an independent research consultant based out of New Mexico. Nice. Is there anyone who has not introduced himself? Otherwise, we're just going to keep rolling. All right, great. So let's go to our warm up questions. And I'll just put up the first two, which are what is something you're excited about today? And what is something that you liked or remembered about the paper? And so people can just raise their hands and we'll go in order. And until I see a hand, I think something I liked or remembered about the paper was that there was no figures. So from the point of view of usually reading papers with figures, that was very notable, but then also that there was clarity and structure despite figures, which are often used as a, uh, not quite an aid to structure a paper, but it's how we often think about in empirical research, like, oh, what is figure one gonna show? But there was clarity in this article without the usage of figures. So Marco, and then anyone else who wants to continue. Yeah, I fully agree that, that, that it was um, uniquely clear so um, I've been kind of lagging behind on the, on the literature, but for me, Mel's paper is, is the best paper so far when it comes to uh, contextualizing free energy principle and like the title implies, really mapping it out, right? Contextualizing in the big, complicated epistemic landscapes that it's all connects to. 
Um, so, so huge props to Mel for that. Um, I think the only other critical piece I've, I've read is from Matteo Colombo, which was more unwieldy. Um, and I think uh, the, 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 the kind of importance of mapping uh, really shows in this paper because it, it opens up a lot of directions to think about the FEP, which stands in stark contrast to a lot of other papers I've read, which, which kind of uh, take it as authoritative and then just move on uh, instead of uh, actually trying to interpret it. And, and so Mel does a great job at guiding the reader in understanding the nuances and the questions that would arise on, when you see those nuances. So I'm excited to hear about people's thoughts today. Cool, very nice. Uh, Tim, and then anyone else who raises their hand. I thought that I was, I, I noted to myself just, you know, uh, as I was reading how clear the writing was, I thought the writing was really clear um, and, and expressive and the explication really well ordered. And um, and there was kind of like, a, I guess, a, a humility. I remember somewhere in this content, I saw the idea of the list of epistemic values, I think it was, you, you called them. And humility was one in the list. And that kind of comes through in that paper, the way that uh, there's no sort of diving for like a discovery or a conclusion. It's really just laying it out and, 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 and giving it to you, to, to, to leaving the questions open, which was really nice. Yep. And also lots of nice philosophy type things like the idea of defending an idea. And so it's not common to see in an empirical paper, like we're going to defend this. It's, it's a lot more like a battlefield of ideas in philosophy and in science, it's a little bit of a different structure. So Sarah, and then anyone else. To like lather on the praise of like, uh, to Mel's paper, but yeah, the, the writing was really good. And actually when I first read it, um, I, I feel like I understand a lot more than when I first read it. And so now I kind of feel like I'm happy to be here because I need to read it a second time. I've learned a lot more. Um, but yeah, the ex the exploration of kind of the beginning of the exploration of all, all these different models, it was, um, yeah, saw a lot of potential. Cool. And that's kind of part of the idea with a dot one and a dot two is sometimes you read the paper and you don't talk to someone about it. You have thoughts one, two, three. And then you have a first conversation about it, or you listen to one video and all of a sudden you have thoughts one through 10, and then you have the discussion and all of a sudden you're you know up to 20. So that's part of the idea of taking the time to really read through these papers. Um, does anyone else wanna add anything? I'll throw up the third warm up question, which is what is something you're wondering about or would like to have resolved by the end of today's discussion? So Alex, Kiefer, then anyone else? Yeah, so I think having this resolved by the end of today is probably a tall order, but I'm I'm interested in the question that's sort of um, explicitly raised the, toward the end of the paper about whether the FEP is a very abstract sort of uh, model of, or in some sense, maybe representation of nature or a pure formalism. And like, that's an interesting line. So I think it's an interesting question. Great question, Sarah, then Marco. Yeah, I was. I, to me, it all just seems like Mel, fix it by the end of the hour. Um, <laughs> but, um, but I, yeah, I was curious to know, like, if if you have any insight into ways that the model could never be applied. You know, like just trying to situate the model in all these worlds that it has potential for. Cool. Any other intro thoughts there, uh, Marco, and then or anyone else? Yeah, um, I'd love. Questions for Mel, I think, but 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 I think would maybe well, I hope so uh, possible to, to to resolve by the end of this stream is um, there's only a very brief note about it, but but you also said that it's also compatible with processualism, something about processualism, and then you, I, I didn't see anything else about it. So I'm not a philosopher, so natural kinds for me always was a bit a weird iffy concept for me. Um, but I was wondering if you could resolve maybe um, the problems of mapping it to natural kinds and stuff, but for processualism, because it seems that active interest is much more a processualist kind of framework, not really compatible with the essentials, objects, properties framework of, of, of ontology. Um, so, so yeah, I'll leave it at that. Cool, let's definitely return to that and define it and get clarity on it. Shannon, then anyone else? Hey, yeah, so I'm really interested in what role the free energy principle or active inference plays in empirical hypothesis testing. Um, and I think this 
paper did a really good job of explaining that the mathematical models can be very useful to generate questions, to generate hypotheses, um, or just to further investigate some empirical phenomenon. And I think it would be good this week and next week to just sort of talk about what it means when you say, I have a free energy principle characterization of system. Very nice, agreed. And um, yes, we have several fun hours of discussion ahead. So I'm just going to flip to this summary slide and ask Mel, when you're conveying this work to different audiences, how do you communicate it? Or what would you like to start with? Just how do you give your 30,000 foot overview, perhaps to different audiences or perspective, yourself in the past, yourself in the future, however you want to do it? Yeah, I guess I saw a lot of um, confusion about what the FEP was and what it was doing. Um, and it was my, before I could really uh, play with it, I had to, um, I had to get clear on what it was and, and make everyone else clear on what it was. Um, and, and so I, I tried to tackle kind of like the most fundamental questions in this paper about what it is that the FTP is and what it's doing. Um, and in some ways, in some ways, I think a lot of those remain kind of unanswered by this paper, but, but no longer unexplored. Like I, 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 I put it all out on paper so, you know, so we can talk about it now. Whereas before there are these things, that, you know, like is the FEP science, science, like is this a scientific model or scientific theory or is it, you know, the, the demarcate, like does it, does it not belong to the domain of science? Um, that, that was a big one and no one had asked that. Um, and then, uh, well, Alex's question, that's one, you know, and, and I didn't come, I, I, I sort of, come, right, the first sentence, right, is, is saying, I think it's belongs to the domain of science. But then I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm writing a paper with Inez Bolto, um, where we're going to come down kind of differently on that, on the, I mean, we're, we're, you know, it's not written, it's not 100% written yet, so we're not sure yet, but, but we come down a little differently on the demarcation problem. And then, um, uh, in terms of Alex's question, that was that was one of my main driving questions. The notion of as if is the FEP like a really abstract representation of natural systems, natural processes, or is it not a representation of anything in nature at all? And that to me is like totally not answered yet. Um, and there's almost, there's almost like a Quinean puzzle, like that. That's almost to me, it's like getting to the the heart of like naturalism as a as an approach in philosophy <laughs> like like uh carl's carl friston's line this whole time has been well there's a dissolving line between just math and and physics proper um and that drives me crazy but uh but i'm coming around to it a little bit that wasn't a good summary of my paper. That was a good summary of, of what I'm excited about exploring further. <laughs> Fun. Yep. Well, just a few things in there that might fly above or below those who have different, um, you know, listening regimes of attention. You said before I could play with it, I had to be clear on it and also help other people be clear. So that just captured this learn by doing, learn by playing, and also learn by serving and teaching because those are some of the key pieces and without being playful and understanding that it's a deep well to dive into. And then also that there's a community that is also curious. Those are some of the key aspects. And then also it almost goes without saying that this is a really exciting philosophy paper and it's an ongoing philosophical question. So people are maybe familiar with a measurement is made on a protein or a new species is found in some forest and it gets nature, science, and people are really excited about a measurement that's made about nature. And then the philosophical questions, potentially because they're fundamental or there's no simple soundbite answer or there's no figure, there's no graphical abstract, you got to read the prose or got to think through it. 
the philosophical questions are often seen as not contemporary or not exciting or not cutting edge, but we're seeing in real time with free energy principle and active inference, the way that maybe we could even call them top-down philosophical priors on what the FEP is, are shaping the realization of what emerges from the bottom up. For example, if it's really from on high and FEP is part of science and it's part of a scientific uh, program, that's gonna be very different several years down the line than if people said this should be thrown over there with the uh, fiction books and you know with a biography of somebody else. So it's pretty interesting just how these top down and bottom up ideas are playing out in the discussion about what this framework is. So pretty interesting. And anyone can raise their hand or give a thought or a question. The other piece I just wrote down until anyone raises their hand was this unanswered but not unexplored, which is taking us back to the map metaphor. And it's the math is not the territory. Of course, a little bit of a pun on the map is not the territory. And what is the map? What is the territory? And where are there dragons? Where do we have just the coastline, but not know what's on the interior? Or where are the underlying features of the world stable or changing? And then where's our map stable or changing in an attempt to understand? And just like the navigation, there's probably pure navigators out there, but also there's those who want to move cargo. So how are we going to get it done with this map and this territory? So we'll go to Alex Kiefer, Sarah, then Mel. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I guess I'm just following up from some of what Mel just said. Um, um, so so I don't want to take this too far in the direction I'm thinking about because it's it's pretty general. So so I, to me, this this paper raises questions that are uh, fundamental, like whether or not you're interested in the FEP. <laughs> and then it's it's partly a matter of seeing how these two things fit together. But like, so Mel mentioned Quine. So one problem that I've always had with the with the line that the FEP is not falsifiable or that it's like distinct in kind from active inference as a process theory is just like, I guess, confirmation holism. So uh, so I just assume that um, if this FEP thing is informing our empirical theories at all, then there must be some semantic logical connections of some kind between the empirical theories and the FEP. So, um, and if, you th you're, if you're a confirmation holist, if you think that, you know, sensory evidence, uh, what we observe kind of back propagates, if you will, to like all of the beliefs in our network, then I think the FEP should be vulnerable to that. But again, that's not really about the FEP. So um, I just want to sort of raise that issue more explicitly and um, I don't know. Cool. Well, just before we go to Sarah, could you just define a little bit better? What is the confirmation holism? Oh, yeah. Where, where so, would it come into, who, who would think differently on this issue and what would be the implications for active yeah. inference? Well, so I don't, I don't know what people think about this issue these days. Um, actually, I'm just, this is sort of like a, I guess it's attributed to Quine and do, do him. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing his name. Um, but the idea is just that you, that sort of scientific theory um, does it like it meets sensory evidence as a corporate body. So like the idea is that if you observe something that's in conflict with your total theory, there's no, uh, I don't know, way a priori of telling which of the claims in your theory you need to revise, right? So like if there's, I mean, you could, you could, for example, you could say, well, there must've been an error. There, there must've been a malfunction in the measuring device. And so you could, you could revise that part of your theory, or you could say, no, this really does falsify my more fundamental assumptions. And so that's kind of what I'm getting at. And I'm not sure uh, if people hold the alternative view these days that like, no, there are certain statements that are meaningful but immune to falsification, but that's the kind of question I'm raising. Excellent. Uh, Sarah, Mel, Marco. I think actually just to not overwhelm Mel, I, um, my question could fit in anywhere. I'd rather just give Mel a chance to Yep, let's, let's go back to Mel, then Sarah. Yeah, the, the web of belief thing, yeah, the, the duhem Klein hypothesis is this idea that, that we've got an integrated web of beliefs and you can't test any atomic proposition in isolation from you can't you can't protect anything in your web of beliefs from from revision with by by new evidence which i think is almost it's, it's almost like very uh compatible with with this kind of bayesian frame view right there's you get this you get this spreading this propagation of of evidence through the network all the way up and down um 
I like that idea. But um, what did I want to respond to? Oh, uh, yeah, someone said someone said active interest is a process theory, and I just want to like set the record straight on that. Um, uh, the the reviewer won on my manuscript. I just I just got reviews back on this. Um, it's not published yet. I just got reviews back, and they pointed out that um, it it's probably misleading to refer to accident prints as a process theory. There have been process theories on the basis of active inference and variational message passing developed. So when you see the like the the there's a a paper Fristin Schwabnick uh Rivoli Joe Pizzullo, Pizzullo is on there um. 2017 it's called active inference of process theory that's that is a process theory that is made from active inference that's that's set in um variational message passing but active inference itself is not a, a process theory so much as a corollary of the fep applied to 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 activity in an environment and then process theories of that have been made so i i should probably i'm, I'm going to go back in and like be more careful with the, the words i use <laughs> cool. Marco, then I'll go ahead. Yeah, um, I'm not sure if, if you met me with uh, process theory, but but I, 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 I intentionally also avoided uh, the phrase process theory because I think it's what I was trying to say with that comment earlier is um, a lot of the treatments of natural kinds and mapping to real states or affairs of the world seems to me more grounded in a more object property oriented uh, philosophy of ontology, right? Um, but, but for me, it, it sounds more that the the ontological um, assumptions or commitments in processualism are far more compatible with active inference, which I wanted to address it later. I'm not sure if now is the right time, but but um, uh, uh, there's there's this issue of not demarcation for is FAP AI uh, uh, scientific, but also demarcation of Markov blankets, right? So as you pointed out rightly, there's this dilemma of, you know, where do you put the threshold for where the boundary of the, of the market blanket is. But for me, that fuzziness is not an issue if you would be more processualist, because then the claim or the necessity would be more, there is a boundary, but that we cannot affirm or confirm where it exactly is, what the you know perfect absolute threshold is, is not an issue itself. Simply that there is heterogeneity, there is certain uh, boundarying of states would be sufficient, I think, because the processual dynamic nature of these systems uh, would mean that you can't say there's a static boundary, simply that there are boundaries between subsystems. Uh, but but that was not my question. My, my comments um, for now was basically one thing I I, I, I think is also interesting is um, seeing FPAI as simply a language. So there's the canonical kind of typical notion of math is a language, and physics is a discipline in which that that's written in in, in math. And I I kind of feel that this is the same here. So uh, Daniel gave very beautiful metaphors of navigation and mapping. And to me, it seems that uh, this whole project, uh, not just theory, but the whole project of, of P and, and active inference, is more of a vehicle of toolkits, of languages that allows you to translate back and forth in disciplines, translate into mathematical abstraction. And as you explore in the mathematical abstract world, you can translate back. So it's like, if you can't see the patterns in empirical data, translate back to abstraction, find patterns there, um, see if you can translate them back, and then you can test them. And so it's like a scientific narrative with a detour. But um, yeah, I don't know. If, if people find it interesting, we'd love to discuss that more later. But yeah. Yeah, the, it is Thanks. interesting. And uh, also the navigation brings us back to cybernetics. And the, the yes. word cybernetics comes from navigation. And so it's almost like if you can't navigate on the water surface, and then you go you abstract beyond some sort of limitation. And so it's kind of funny because the mapping metaphor, again, it is a physical one, it's related to cybernetics, but then also there's this idea of a map in mathematics and a mapping is a function. And so there's this abstraction to abstraction mapping. And then there's also that as a map onto the physical world because we're embodied agents. So if Mel or anyone else wants to raise their hand, otherwise I think there's a few other threads yeah. to highlight there. Go ahead, Mel. Yeah, I just want to flag something Marco said quickly. Um, the Markov blanket isn't actually all that, it's not actually, as, as a boundary, the Markov blanket is not actually all that diffuse and dynamical. It's actually, it's actually harnessed to like particular particles in, in, a, in a sense. So 
we think when we think about you know the the boundaries of an organism or the boundaries of a, a a cell wall or something right you're constantly you are dispersing the cell is dispersing right the the material of which the cell the organ the tissue the human being the society is made up right these are these are these are diffuse and they're dissipating there the material there's a constant turnover in the, in the, like the material composition of these things right um and and the markov blanket doesn't handle that right now right the, the markov blanket is roped to particular particles so to speak in in your system so it's um there, there's a, there's a, a kind of a desire in, um, in the original like Burkhoff stuff on dynamical systems. Um, you get, you get uh, 1927, Burkhoff 1927. You get, um, he kind of proposes a notion of wandering sets, and um, there's kind of a desire. Car Carl has a desire to extend the Markov blanket so as it, so as to be able to accommodate wandering sets. Where, where there is a turn, right? That where the the material makeup goes away, and yet the boundary persists, right? You get turnover, but um, it it doesn't do that yet. So it's actually it's actually it's not nearly as like dynamical as as you want it to be. I think the the wandering sets and the attracting sets. It kind of reminds me again with a navigation metaphor. The attracting set could be like there's like a whirlpool and all the boats around it are kind of being drawn into this attracting set. And if they move away, then they're drawn back in. And then the wandering set is like a flotilla of ships. Maybe some are joining and some are leaving, but they're maintaining a coherence as they dynamically are moving through the ocean or as their subunits are changing because there's this dissipation that was brought up. And then the living systems that are far from equilibrium are the ones that are apparently successfully resisting that dissolution. And so what is it that those living systems are doing? And that's the what is life question. That's Schrodinger 1944 to Maxwell 2018, that pipeline. So it's, it's really interesting questions. Marco, then any other raised hands? Thanks. Uh, and, um, thanks for the clarification. Um, Maybe I'm, I'm misunderstanding something, but um, so so I guess for me, maybe it's my, my personal uh, interpretation of, of it all, but for me, the primacy is actually less about the formalism as, for example, Julia Pearl initially originally uh, formulated it as, but what for me is interesting is more the conceptual interpretation of there's an intermediating kind of interface, right? There's a unidirectional flow um, that's, that's in its dynamics allow for this protection of states that shouldn't go beyond a certain uh, boundary, for example. Um, and in that sense, it, 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 oh wait, and one more thing is that maybe that which is to be bounded or protected doesn't have to be a particular state as such. Maybe it's like a relation. For example, you're protecting the property of certain nodes, of certain states, of certain densities, that they are adaptively viable for other systems that they might be in relation with. Um, but, but I think in general, I think what, what this all shows is that there's a lot of freedom at least in my opinion, to uh, interpret the picture that follows from FAP AI. Uh, I'm still kind of unclear why it's not uh, dynamic because the mathematical nodes can be variably mapped to physical nodes, in my opinion, because I'm not sure what you mean with particles, right? So it's, it's not like we, we, we do the boundaries in terms of particles, but more in terms of uh, sensory states or, or, or that through which um, the Bayesian inference is mediated. Um, but yeah, that's my perspective, but I would love to hear more about this. So for others. Cool. If anyone else raises their hand, I would just kind of almost take stock. There's a few threads happening here. There's some philosophy of science questions. What is a principle? What is a theory? What is falsification? All these types of questions were um, brought up from the more philosophical side of the literature. And then there's this a little bit related discussion about Markov blankets, dynamical systems, the definition of empirical measurements and how cleanly we sort them into these different types of uh, natural kinds, if we want to use the philosophical word, or maybe just a functional whole to be less uh, essentialist about it. There's a few different threads happening here. So it's just good to keep track of these pieces. And uh, yeah, if, uh, Stephen, I saw your hand raised or anyone else. 
yeah hi thanks um i suppose one thing that i've been quite interested in is dimensionality in the sense that entropy is a, is a dimensionless sort of property so you get this interesting question that so the free energy principle in a way is mostly dimensionless or it's like some sort of trend and then when that comes into active influence it doesn't get fully dimensionalized well it, it, it doesn't it, it, it's like lots of different active influence processes each one can contribute to dimensionality as like multi sort of threads but it, the, the actual signal unlike when you mentioned like say in cybernetics where you have something that is guiding you the signal itself doesn't have you know as we say the signal doesn't contain per se the data particularly the entropic noise it's through inference of the dynamics within the, the noise that the generative model can sort of then process that and so that it sort of raises this question about you know when things go from one level to another in, in an act of influence like blankets and these states um is that transference between states also dimensionless in, in that sense or you know where did dimensions start to come in as we go up the blankets or maybe as things get aggregated interesting question and that reminds me of some other questions that have been raised about the dimensionality of active inference like is each sensory modality enshrouded in its own blanket or is it sort of a tuple that gets passed across a single organismal blanket that represents multiple sensory uh possibilities um so interesting questions anyone else want to raise their hand or we can just start to slowly walk through the paper and just any thoughts that people have will raise them. So we checked out the abstract in the dot zero video. Here's the roadmap. So this is a pretty thorough roadmap because we can see a lot of the sections and a lot of the terms that come into play. So Mel, I have a question. What was your intention with writing it? You said that you wanted to clarify it and learn as well. How did that translate into this structure? And then maybe where are you headed, you know, off this roadmap? This was one journey. What is your next journey? Yeah, so a, a friend brought my attention to um, to the free energy principle and I think fall of 2017, which would have been like my penultimate semester in undergrad. And I was taking a course on like, mathematical psychology so um uh if if you one of my references is right so the, the reference to this normative model this normative versus descriptive process versus right that 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 reference is our duncan loose 1995 which is um he's he's one of the primary figures in in math like so a lot of cognitive science you know has has subsumed math like but but the idea of, of like having these formal mathematical models of um, of cognition so that's that's what I was enmeshed in so so I I was uh, that's what I was thinking about most at that time so I was like oh a new you know a new mathematical model of psychology perfect um, and I I I was very skeptical at first and I dove in and I um, it it brought me under <laughs> it was really there's a lot there and um, and I really struggled. So, so at first, I really wanted to do that too. It, it, like, you know, it was immediately apparent to me that there's this big complicated thing that, that very few people understand. And there's a lot of widespread misunderstanding of what it is and what it's doing. So I, I tried to do that at first. And I came up with like a little, uh, a little like dossier on, on like the basics of the SEP in like some of the early formulations as an undergrad. Um, and I put that up. And, but it, it, it didn't, solve kind of a lot of the bigger uh i guess like philosophy of science questions about it, what it is and what it's doing um so i this is like a second stab at that and and from here um i i so i was thinking of the fep one one way it helped me to think about it is is as a model and i don't 
I, I guess I don't view um, models as strict natural kinds or like strict the scientific kinds. I don't, I don't think that there's like a, a list of necessary and sufficient conditions for being a model or, or like an essence to being a model. And the FEP is either, you know, definitively a model or not. I think, I think it's, it's helped me quite a lot to think of the FEP as a model. It's, it's uh, reduced my prediction error, if you will, to think of it as a, as a very abstract, formal, generic, targetless model. Um, but, but, you know, and I think in a lot of ways, thinking of it as a modeling language or a modeling framework is also really fruitful. I think that's important. There's not, there's not a, a, a philosophy of science literature on modeling frameworks for modeling languages, right? Um, but, but I think that's, it, it's probably more of a modeling framework or modeling language than it is a model per se. Um, and, and next, so I, I'm, I'm next, I'm going to try to work on a paper with, um, with Ines, um, um, kind of exploring what it is to be a principle, right? Like, what's the principle? Because there, there isn't a, a fill side that is to run on principles, really, right? What is a principle? Um, that's next. I also, um, there, <laughs> there's been a lot of comparison of the FEP to, to natural selection, to Darwin's theory of natural selection. And um, when you ask people about that, and this is, this is sort of the, 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 the core like pro FEP camp, the core like we're working on the FEP camp um, often draws that comparison. And I think that this, is, so, so what, what they mean to be doing there is saying, well, it's not directly falsifiable. To, to Alex's point, I think, I think everything is sort of falsifiable. Every, everything in science is falsifiable in so much as it's, if it, if it doesn't get traction, it falls out of use, if it's not useful then we don't use it right and then it, it it ceases to be kind of part of our collective consciousness as as researchers and i think that if if the fep fails to be useful you know it, it falls by the wayside that's that's it's consigned to dustbins of history um so so there is that in that sense i think there definitely is that kind of like confirmation holism there right um if it fails to produce useful lower order theories then it it, it falls out of use. Um, so, so I think that, that in, in trying to draw a comparison between natural selection and the free energy principle, people want to say, well, the FEP, like natural selection, is not directly falsifiable um, in the way that natural selection isn't directly falsifiable. And it's, um, it's also supremely useful. Um, it has this widespread kind of uh, both empirical use and, and um, you know, grand explanatory power. And I think that this is sort of ultimately conflating multiple notions of natural selection. So multiple kind of discrete formulations of natural selection. One of these due to Popper and one of these, one of them sort of due to, to Darwin and then it gets formulated in like Lewinson and Godfrey Smith and stuff like that. Um, and one of them that's basically due to Popper, which Popper later kind of recants as, as, a, as a mistake, as an error in his own thinking. Um, so I want to do that. And I, I also think there's kind of a meta narrative there. Because I've been working on models and um, reification in models. So, so when we what's happening with the FTP we can think of as reification, conceptual reification or pernicious reification where um, you get uh, confusing the map for the territory, basically. Perfect. Thanks for that response. And also welcome, uh, Scott. We will go to Alex Kiefer, then Marco, then Tim. Okay. Um, so I guess there are a number of things that I want to say. Um, so, as far as, okay, right, so I think what Mel just brought up um, reminded me that there's a, there's a um, one way of, of I guess I've discussed this with Mel and others, so I'm, um, apologies if this isn't in the paper, I'm, I'm not quite sure, I need to look at it again, but basically one way in which this thing could fail to be falsifiable is if it's not so much a claim as like a, an approach or like a, a sort of stance that leads you to make certain claims. So like, um, so 
to put that in a, if you wanted to put a negative light on that, you could say it's a moving target, but I, I don't mean to disparage the FEP at all. I think, I think, um, you know, one thing that's going on here is that Carl Friston is a fairly creative scientist, obviously he's sort of trying to do something new. And so he's, you know, this, this is a framework, uh, Mel mentioned thinking of this as a modeling language. Um, it, it's a framework that's still under construction to some extent. And, um, uh, so you could say it's, well, it's not falsifiable because it's not a particular, you know, mathematical description. It's a uh, generator of descriptions like that. Um, so I'll stop there for now. Yep. And just to draw out one quick thought there, it's the principle has been metaphor. Uh, the metaphor is between the principle and the language. So could anyone falsify English? Could anyone falsify the idea of English grammar? Or is English a moving target? Is it something that can't be falsified, but you can make claims under the umbrella or using the English grammar approach that the claim could be useful or not, or it could be useful for one person or not for another person. So once you get into the specific process theories, the specific claims, then you're talking empirical data or you're talking about the perspective of individual researchers. But then when you pull back to the principle level, and Mel, it sounds really interesting about the work on fleshing out what a principle is, it's a little bit more like you can't fal falsify Python, but there's programs that don't work. Okay, so Marco, Tim, and then Dave. Thanks. Um, so first of all, I apologize in advance to the philosophers because I'm going to consciously tread into pragmatism. Um, so, so again, I'm not a philosopher, but but I'm kind of interested in, in the angle of pragmatism in, on these matters. So um, reiterating again the theme of of, of, of seeing the fringe principle and active inference as more of a language and a framework. Um, we also, I think, obtain an interesting maybe mode of falsification that actually Mel just gave us, which is um, give a certain approach or framework or a uh, system of doing science um, is selected by the niche that is a scientific enterprise, then that is maybe an interesting form, uh, well, the opposite of falsification, right? So if it doesn't get adopted, then that, that maybe is a kind of falsification. But then an interesting uh, implication here is following the popularity and a strange like popularity, I must add, uh, of FEP in so many different circles um, is, I think, a sign that that the scientists or the researchers who have utilized it have experienced an embodied signal of usefulness. And then following that comes a question of, okay, then where does it come from, right? And then for me, what's really, really interesting is then, then the FEP is the perfect kind of approach to answering or approaching that question, right? So, so upon adopting or upon being exposed, internalizing the FEP and active inference, what changes within? So now we get also two kinds of approaches to language, not just you can communicate with other people, but also how do the different models you, you, you embody communicate with each other? So the unifying uh, capacity uh, of, of, of free energy principle is not just uh, in the abstraction, in the papers, but also for people uh, themselves, at least for me and uh, anecdotally also others, that is, I think, one of the more unique aspects of active influence. It really evokes the sense of unification. It allows you to use a single framework and lens for a variety of phenomena and theories. And to me, that is maybe the biggest argument for it being scientific, for the merits it evokes our genders in scientific enterprises, including their constituents, such as people and researchers. Um, so uh, yeah, so yeah, we'd love to hear more from you. Uh, especially philosophers on pragmatist um, perspectives of this. Sorry, I've been binging a bit of Hasok Chan recently, so maybe that's why I'm asking this. <laughs> Thank you, Marco. Tim, then Dave, then anyone else who raises their hand. Uh, that, did you say pragmatist just now? Yes, that good, was pragmatism. Good, yeah, good segue to what I wanted to mention, I guess, because uh, I was, when you mentioned reification, that resonated with thoughts as I read the paper uh, about. Um, Whitehead's fallacy of misplaced concreteness, you know, the idea that this 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 not in the processes that exists that's being revealed um, is actually a process. And the things that we see in the objects of the world are really just um, uh, sort of a reification of the processes. And, and you mentioned natural selection. That was another thing that came up, but not in the way I don't think you were mentioning it now. The way I thought of it in the reading the paper was uh, basically, the objects, as we call them, are simply uh, processes that we can take a perspective on that survived. 
you know, they're, they're there because they survived, they stayed, they became, they sustained themselves as, as you like to call it, you know, self-organized and all that, right? Um, yeah, so anyway, interesting, thanks. Yeah, thanks for tying that. Dave and then Alex Kiefer. Yeah, Mel, uh, you don't seem to give the exact title of the 1995 loose paper. Which was that? I've got his 95 book, but he didn't seem to have, is it just the introduction to that, uh, um, the Taro Indo collection? Oh, Mel, you're muted, but look it up and then post it in the YouTube yep. chat or comments, not the Jitsi chat, Good. because it will make a noise. So post it on the YouTube yeah. and then anybody who wants to post any of these papers they're mentioning, really the place to do it is the YouTube comments or send it to me and I'll put it in the YouTube video description so that everybody can access it. Alex Kiefer, then anyone else who raises their hand. Uh, yeah, I guess I was just gonna create some more problems for a simple discussion here. Um, in, well, in that, okay, so, so pragmatism's on the table and reification. Um, so um, I guess for similar Quinean type reasons, I'm not sure how to think about these things. I think what Tim brought up about um, perception forgive me if I get it wrong, but perception being something like a reification of an ongoing process, I think is a really good point. So like, um, I, I mean, in a, there's a sense in which I'm a fan of reification because it's like, yeah, maybe that's just what we're doing when we, you know, we take some, we have a language, uh, maybe it's an internal neural language or something, or maybe it's an external one and we, and we take it to be about the world and that's our lens on the world. So without reification in some sense, I don't know um, how we, we would have any any kind of perception of things, but I'm sure that there's a way to distinguish bad kinds of reification from good kinds. Um, and I was going to say something else, but it's I completely forget. So, yeah, good point. It's kind of like stability and plasticity. Remember those two top level descriptors of the cybernetic paper that we heard from in the last couple of weeks. And it's kind of like they're not intrinsically good or bad because you could be too plastic or too stable and succeed or not. And then beyond whether something exists or not, humans have this kind of second layer where it's like, oh yeah, that exists, but I don't like it. So it's perpetuating itself, but then we just don't prefer it. And so that's just our agents level perspective. And so it's not just enough to be reified. There's something else happening there. So Marco, then Sarah. Yeah, I would uh, build on uh, Alex's uh, great point. So, so <laughs> one of my favorite notions is uh, Reconstanian ladders. Or in Buddhism, they also call uh, talk about the simile of the raft, um, and I think this is really what it's about, right? So we're kind of like like Alex said, we kind of stuck with reification. That's just part and parcel of how we engage with the world. Because the alternative was believing in nothing, and then if you literally believe nothing, then how the hell you're going to engage with the world, right? So all you can do is have good re as good as possible reification, or as the least worst reifications. Um, and again, for me, this is this processualist kind of approach, uh, or at least perspective, that we are just engaging in finding better reifications, such that that particular reification, or such that that particular um, embodiment or incorporation of a model leads to better generative dynamics, and then to better you know, active inference, um, to, to use active inference as the framework here. Um, yeah, so I, yeah, that's that. Cool. Sarah, then Mel. Um, I don't know. I, this is possibly going to be an embarrassing moment for me, but I feel like that's my job. Um, <laughs> I don't really understand. Like, as I was kind of stepping through FEP, the math of it, there's a there's a point where I'm like, eh, it seems like Bayesianism has got some, like, it doesn't seem like even it, the foundations of what FEP is, or a lot of things are based on, I mean, this idea of, of belief and priors and, and, and that something, you know, something is absolutely true. I guess I just wonder, Mel, if you, you know, if you ran up against that or like if there's a, a deeper background that I'm probably not aware of in philosophy about the limits of Bayesianism um, or these kinds of models. So that's, I don't it's really a vague question, but uh, it's the best I could do. No, that's an excellent question. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, it is. A, it is a great question. Thing. Go ahead. Yeah, it's an excellent question. So there's a. Um, yeah, I think I think when I was first grappling with Bayesianism, there's a way in which um, <laughs> there's sort of like a, a Laplacean demon smuggled in. Like there's a there's a view from nowhere smuggled in. There's a a, a 
a perfect knower smuggled in. Um, and that would be the case for the FEP, but we've we've um, we've worked out a way for it to be just a, a, a cognizer that's like self-supervising, right? It's, its knowledge is limited. Its access to, to the true world out there is, is intrinsically limited. And yet it's able to self-correct and self-supervise. And if you want, um, I think sort of the best recent explanation of like why this is the case and, and how it's able to do that is um, Yakim Hoey's paper in, I want to say Synthesa, and I want to say it's something self-supervision and the free entry. <laughs> I guess I have to, I guess, I guess I have to drop this link as well. Let me go do that. Cool. Yeah, that's what's so fun is the discussion. Yeah, I would love it. Thank you. Yeah, the discussion. We raise so many fun links and so many connections, and then we just make sure to post them so that everybody can asynchronously or synchronously be in the game. So Marco, then anyone else? Oh, no raised hand. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah, no, I really love that. But I, I, I want to propose saying instead, instead of a perfect knower, because Laplace demon indeed is, knows everything. But for me, Bayesianism is really more about, if we would have to make an analogy, it's a perfect pragmatic learner. So in essence, what it, it, it the normative principle kind of um, by design says, this is the perfect way of knowing, if you also add on a lot of assumptions for the particular age. But but uh, yeah, I guess a bit half jokingly, you could say it's a Friston's demon, you know, the perfect pragmatic learner. Um, so, yeah, um, I just yeah. I just ran up against this. Just I, in my everyday life, I contradict myself in so many ways. I can't even keep track. You know, like one one part of me thinks this, the other part of thinks that, and they're literally. And so I, yeah, I just I just started realizing my own, my own limitations with respect to knowledge and how knowledge would even be modeled. But that's part of the design, I think. Uh, that's something I often like to point out is, it, it's not about having no conflicts. It's more about, given that conflicts will arise, how to best cope with them. So the adaptive engagements with the world is also reflexive. So your own struggles, your own challenges, your own seeming contradictions are also opportunities to grow. And that's, again, only possible with this uh, demon that, that, that uh, uh, is pragmatically learning all the time. I'm curious about so hopefully this. Hopefully, that's a bit more optimistic. Yeah, I'm curious about this perfect demon because I would say that a, a Bayesian updating agent could make a update that helps it survive in its niche or not. It could overlearn or underlearn and just simply fail to exist in the future. And so, natural selection again is the hand that just sweeps off the table the Bayesian learners that aren't existing. And I would challenge. You know, there's many thoughts on Bayesianism and and a lot of debates, but alternative being what frequentism or some other vaguely unspecified mathematical framework that somebody doesn't want to put a name on to. And so I think it's an interesting question, how does mathematics and how do formalisms come into play with philosophy at all? What would any equation have to say about philosophy? But then once you're in that world of trying to make models that have some element of formalism, whether it's natural language or whether it's another language, then I think you start wandering over towards the idea of a learning or updating agent and not needing to take the baggage that it's a perfect learning agent, just that it is an adaptive agent of some kind. Sarah, and then anyone else who raises their hand. Yeah, this gets, for me though, um, this gets into a, a kind of a, I don't know the, the clever philosophy word, but um, you know, this is also why I asked the question in a prior week about the Markov blanket, because it's like, I, I picture like a monster truck rally where two two FEP models are battling it out basically in my own brain or whatever. And so it's like, where is the, so so in that paradigm where you have these kinds of objectifications, you know, of one FEP with another FEP, like where the, um, then you have questions around like the boundary between the two. And there's this kind of a, it, there's a, there's a thingness about all of this that um, kind of gets me in like an infinite regress. So that's, yeah fun alex keeper then anyone else yeah so i mean i think this this issue we're talking about now is really interesting i uh yeah i, I was wondering recently whether bayesianism is a 
is a prior <laughs> and what that does when you start thinking about it. But I think this is totally relevant to the, the theme of overall theme of the paper because, well, of course it is, but I mean, it's directly relevant because um, like it, we're, we're talking about things that get to be so general, theories, theories or frameworks or whatever that are so general that they start to raise these really real weird questions. But one thing I was gonna say is just that like, I think maybe this is implicit or explicit in what people said already, but like the fact that we're dealing with variational inference, well, for okay, first of all, Bayesianism, even if it's Bayes theorem itself is supposed to like descend from God or whatever, it's like actually building subjectivity into, into science more right explicitly than the alternatives. I think people mentioned contrasting it to frequentism. But then we're, we're taking a further step away from objectivity and saying, yeah, and each each creature sort of learns its own approximation to that. Um, so I think, um, I don't think you can eliminate uh, claims to objectivity entirely. Um, I don't, I, and so this may be, maybe this is the, the, the best we can do, um, or at least a, a step in the right direction. Very interesting point. Marco, then anyone else? Marco, then Mel. Yeah. I I, I fully agree. Um, so objectivity can't be eradicated. And I think that's kind of the beauty of how, like Alex said, uh, this active inference stuff is taking the the rejection of, of pure objectivity even further. It, it's really approaching or making at least the, 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 the building the foundations for an objective science of subjectivity, right? And and to, to add, uh, to touch back on the uh, half jokey idea of a Bristolian demon, um like alex said right so they create their own particular approximations um they have to have first instantiated particular priors but more importantly you also noted on um sorry you also noted on uh, infinite regress so so that's another beauty for me um there's no problem of infinite regress because traditionally with homunculi and stuff and controllers or agents or will there's this yeah but what is controlling that and there's this movement towards smaller and smaller but that's not the case with this scenario because the <clears throat> dependency is not like a vehicle dependent on the driver, but it's more system dependent on each other. And I think that's kind of the beauty um, where the agents in the perfect demon scenario, it would be more like um, minimal dependence on the agent's faultiness and more about how well the niche of the context prepares that agent uh, for the niches to be encountered in their life. Uh, and for those, you know, with a penchant for Buddhism, it, it's, it's also very beautiful how it relates to this idea of the mutually arising or, or, or co-origination. Um, it, 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 it's just, in essence, like Alex said, it's about subjectivity, the, 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 the co-dependency of how densities or how states or, yeah, I like densities, how densities kind of adapt each other. Anyways, awesome. what is worth. Awesome. Mel, then Tim, then anyone else? Yeah, so I sort of want to, I, I guess I want to push Marco maybe to, to bring up a, a question he raised when you were giving us the, the sort of like breakdown of this paper, which I I thought when he raised that, I was like, wow, that's, that's a really difficult question that I can't answer. So <laughs> um, I think that would push a very interesting discussion if only because it's a question that I don't know how to answer and it's a question of um it was something about well aren't aren't physical descriptions just kind of formal descriptions at some level anyway so you were you were, Marco you raised the question do you remember do you know what I'm talking about no well you raised <laughs> you raised the question about about um about this line that I drew between a mere, you know, mathematical, formal, statistical description of something and a, a, a physical description proper, and you sort of challenged that that such a line exists, which is which is Friston's line. But somehow, uh, I, I love Carl, but but um, somehow the way he has always raised that it feels to me like a cop-out it feels to me like a, some sort of evasion but when you pushed me on that i was like you know yeah you're right <laughs> maybe there isn't maybe there isn't a hard line between and and this this feeds into 
Alex's question as well. Um, of it, it, it's 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 all this it's all continuous. This this question of like, well, you know, uh, is math natural? Like, is is math an arbitrary formal system? Um, where we've invented all the rules and it, it it just has nothing to do with you know contingent nature or or is it continuous you know is it is it just descriptions of nature at a very abstract level um is there a is there a hard line between information theory well you know going full james is is there a is there a disappearing line between um between inference techniques between techniques for Bayesian inference um, as a, you know, just as a statistical technique and, a, and thermodynamics, right? You know, statistical mechanics. Uh, those are the questions that I'm like, oh man, I can't, I can't, that's, that seems to me to be the most pressing question behind all of this to me. Yes, math, invented or discovered, thermodynamics, invented or discovered, FEP, invented or discovered, inference overall, statistics, all these kinds of awesome interrelated questions, philosophy, invented or discovered. Tim, Alex Kiefer, then anyone else? I was just uh, just kind of the homunculus uh, infinite regress thing versus the dependent arising sort of co-emergence of the, of the, of, of the agent. I think that contrast is really something neat that to, I don't know how to explore it, but they seem like opposite ends of, you know, two poles of the same kinds of consideration. And I feel uh, like I'm repping Whitehead here today, but it also t touches on what he talks about when he talks about the bifurcation of nature that he decries, right? So, I mean, um, uh, so, when we talk about taking a perspective and saying that object emerges to my perception, first of all, because it survived as a self-recreating thing over time, you know, that it, it, uh, you know, um, and, and I did too. We're, we're both in the same, we're both the same thing. You know what I mean? Like, it's not like I'm apart from the world. The reason it's in my world is because I'm in its world and, and we're, it, the nature is not bifurcated into the, the mind and the, and the physical anyway. Awesome point, Tim, because we often say in active inference that the organism comes to embody the statistical regularities of its ecological niche. And so people look out there at the ecology around them and they can say, okay, that's natural. But then the organism is also natural and wouldn't the generative model of its niche be just like its hand, be just another phenotype that's generative and therefore natural as well? So Alex Kiefer, then Blue, then Marco. Um. I might just, I might actually pass for now. I just wanted to drill down more on this idea of like mathematics, uh, what, what you know, pure mathematical formalisms and how they might represent. But I think there's a lot of interesting stuff on the table right now. I'd rather hear about it at the moment. Perfect. Blue, then Marco. So maybe it'll, I'll, I'll wrap it back for Alex because I kind of want to just touch on this dependent arising, right? Or like the mutual arising, um, you know, the world exists because it exists in my mind. Um, and also the idea of whether or not mathematics is natural, right? Like, is, is this like something that we invented or is something that we discovered? But I, I would like to make the argument that, that really like, as humans, we are also natural, right? So, so if it can be discovered in more than one place at more than one time by more than one human, as many strong theories in science are, they bubble up together. I think that there is some kind of natural arising or, or naturalness to um, these kinds of studies. Thanks, Blue. Marco, then anyone else? Thanks. Um, so, so uh, I think I know what you meant. Uh, with my comments, uh, no, I think, but but let me allow uh, to push back on myself. Um, so so I, th I think a priori we, we we only have just descriptions, um, and the only kind of extra qualifiers or properties of these descriptions as such that's relevant and and grounded is their etiology or their genealogy. Where do they come from, right? So if we're already talking about descriptions, we already have to be talking about systems that can, that can generate descriptions. And so I don't think there's a hard line uh, uh, in, in terms of an essence, right? That's, that's intrinsic property. 
But I think the hard line is more about their path, their genealogy. How did that description can come to be? Um, and then I think we go back to uh, language again. And I think this thanks to um, Liam Bright, shout out to him, uh, who introduced me to Carnap. And he, Carnap talked about valid physical languages. Um, and I think that's kind of the beauty that the FEP is maybe not perfect for every state of affairs or space of affairs. Um, but I, I do think it's true that, that you can transfer a lot of what we now at least see as valid physical descriptions to the language FEP. But if, more importantly, to me, the beauty is the generative aspect. So if you transfer something into, um, uh, translate something into active language of active inference, then you also transfer the generative aspects to it. So if you transfer them to active inference and then you explore in the space that's generated there uh, and you see a pattern or something, then that hypothesis obtained or derived in an abstract space can be also translated back. And so it's the validity of that back and forth translational path that I think uh, is more important to the question of, is it a physical description, right? Is it, is it physically rooted or rootable if you have these valid languages? I don't know if it makes sense. Yeah. Also, small point, uh, so very small points is, is um, I've always also taken issue with Carl saying that we embody statistical regularities about the world. Not that it's not true, but I think it's, it's, it's uh, only a partial view. For me, what's more relevant is that there are statistical regularities due to the fact that the world is systematic. Um, and these regularities allow this kind of tethering, right? So it's for me, it's more about embodying a bridge with the world. And what you then get, at least my motivation is, then that leaves a more openness to also give room for the unique aspect of humanity. As in humans are weird. We're like really weird. I don't know why we're so weird exactly, but we're really weird. And that weirdness has less to do with cis regularities and more about what is evoked or generated or cultivated upon embodying this statistical regularities and upon being faced with the challenges of, of dealing with the world. Um, and so I guess we have statistical regularities of the world and kind of weird irregularities of ourselves, uh, if that makes sense. Yes. I just want to share that. Yeah, we, we, we swim in those regularities of the niche. You know, if the fish were yes. just the statistical regularities of water, there wouldn't be a fish there. So it has to be <laughs> something a little bit bigger. Now, another uh, cool thing is we, we've been talking about this uh, similarity between the physical ecology and then our social ecology, which is also natural. So we can think of a physical example of stigmergy, like the ants that are digging out their nest and they're modifying their physical environment, which then changes how their physical behavior is implemented. But with this conversation and in the literature, especially, there's a stigmergy at the level of information, the informational niche, which has different perspectives within it, different agents that have different access to different kinds of information. And those kinds of communications in the informational niche are natural. And the generative models that we have are natural as well. So there's just so many fun ways that we can think about, all right, well, now that we're niche constructing in this info niche, what kinds of uh, things do we want to put in this construction that we're working on together? So just like the ant engineer might say, well, we could kind of have a, a corollary to this tunnel that branches off this way. Maybe there's something useful over here. Oh, we falsified that corollary tunnel. It's not useful. It retracts. So in this social world in this informational world how do we take that natural perspective and also make it useful for the colony scott and then anyone else who raised their hand just wanted to say with regard to the fish i think some of you heard the example i read research a number of years ago where they took a semi-rigid piece of plastic and put it in a stream and then they varied and increased the speed of the stream and ultimately the piece of plastic started undulating with the periodicity that resembled the fish and so they, what they realize is the fish doesn't swim through water, it actually passes through the water. So it was really, be, over deep time, fish are formed by the water. Now again, not the entirety of the fish, it's also formed by other relationships with other organisms and media. <clears throat> but it's similar to the way that insects, bats, and birds independently developed wings because they were flying in the medium of air. But I think, I think Mel has a point. Yep, let's Mel go. Yeah, we'll go. Just, yeah, Mel, sorry. then Shannon, then Marco. I I put there's a it's like a lovely little video of a of a dead like salmon in in a stream, and it's 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 
behaving in this way that really seems very lifelike but dead um and and i i think i i i once like posted this with the caption like is this is this morphological computation and that made a lot of people there was a, there were, like people were very up in arms over whether or not that was morphological computation <laughs> the dead fish <laughs> Interesting question and synapses and neurons being physical, what isn't morphological computation under certain perspectives? Shannon, then Marco, then anyone else? That was a, a brilliant picture of what I'm thinking in my head right now. And um, to piggyback on what um, both Mel and Scott just said, so the dead salmon or the piece of plastic, you know, is passing through the water in and, and you can very clearly see how the environment or the medium that it's in is forming its behavior, even though it's dead or it's plastic. And as you get into more weird creatures, creatures with culture, like humans, even fish that interact in, in groups and communicate with other fish in a cultural way, then you end up adding different layers of medium. So you don't just have water, you have now the other fish are in your medium. They're part of this social organism. And then with humans, now the other humans are in, are, are, are making another social medium that you're interacting in. So you have more and more in the terminology, like nested levels of environments that you're embodying. Thanks for that point, Shannon. Marco, then Scott, then anyone else. Yeah, I'm not sure if, if it's appreciated, but but I'll, con I'll continue a theme of uh, linking active inference to some uh, spirituality slash Eastern uh, traditions. Is um so so the notion of the Tao, right, uh, which stands for the way. I think it's also for me it always evokes this uh, resonance with active inference because um, there's this emphasis on 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 this the way the Tao of how the universe works implicitly that is unnameable. Right, and I think that that is also related to this uh, issue of reification earlier. That there is modes, there's systematicity, there's rules to how the world works, but fundamentally, it's unnameable. The moment you name it, it's not the real way, right? And uh, this this kind of finding the intermediate part, the the one of least effort, or as often is described, uh, no effort way. Um, this this too is is exactly. Uh, resonant with that picture of uh, the life, the, the dead fish in the stream. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's just in general, there's this theme that I find also very exciting, how much active inference actually helped me appreciate a lot of philosophies and tradition, not just Eastern, but a lot of, let's say, uh, forgotten wisdoms and forgotten insights from not just uh, religion uh, and not just spirituality, but also arts, right? We often see this false dichotomy of arts as something frivolous and science but truth. But a lot of insights, scientific insights, were actually prefigured by a lot of artists in a conceptual form. Uh, and so in my experience, active inference or this general, this general um, lens or perspective allows us to reappreciate that which has become too decoupled from our modern, postmodern, over-rational, over-analytic kind of way of engaging with the world. Thank you, Marco. It's almost like, dare I say it, the math is not the territory. So we'll go to Scott, Blue, Sarah, and then Alex Kiefer. So uh, a couple other just observations along the lines of what um, Shannon was alluding to, I think. In Foucault, um, philosopher Foucault, not the pendulum, Foucault, he um, talked about pastoral control, which was the idea that the persona of a person is formed by their external norms and rules and laws and culture that they're exposed to. So the same kind of thing like a plastic toy in a metal mold being formed. So there's that same kind of notion. And one of the things I think is, is interesting about active inference for me is that those differentials, what is the motivation for closing differentials? And the motivation is de-risking and leverage grossly stated. I think. So the idea is if you have a differential between you and the environment, um, you want to protect yourself from the harm from that differential or exploit the opportunities of that differential. That differential is either temperature differential in the case of a heat engine 
or an information differential in the case of a von Neumann or Shannon extension of the second law of thermodynamics. So the same differentials you have in Carnot's equation for heat and cold, you need the differentials in information to have market exchange, and I think to have Bayesian exchange. So what was what's the status of a Bayesian process if you have no differentials between the in, input and the ex expectation? <laughs> so along those lines, what it seems like is we have these identity stacks. This is what I think Shannon was alluding to, not Claude Shannon, but our Shannon here. <laughs> um, and both, perhaps. Um, but that the, you take these combinations of things that in the environment that make you who you are. We're like bower birds. We collect up these externalities and internalize them for our expectations. And then there's a whole set of them. And then we go out and identify those that are anomalous for our expectations. So on another call earlier, there's a, uh, someone who talked about the difference uh, narrative and story and how your internal narrative and your the story is being told you have to line up well to the extent that this is a differential that motivates activity of interaction and markets have been described as places where you find price discovery and solution discovery at large scales so the bayesian process seems like a way of incrementally identifying the externalities that are anomalous for your expectations and then being able to internalize them is kind of that Bayesian process, I think. So anyway, it's something, the, the, part of the reason that is so appealing to me is that I've been arguing for a number of years that markets and countries and companies are biological because they're iterations and artifacts of structures of biological beings, which is us. They happen to take on an abstraction and an informational embodiment, but they represent those same processes as biological systems in terms of those differentials and trying to render externalities innocuous or exploit externality differences so anyway there's a lot this is feeling very like a, a there's a strange attractor here it feels like that's pulling the conversation in the direction of that um generative systems that i define the last point i define life as being autocatalytic Entry, entropy secreting systems. So these autocatalytic, they keep going, and entropy secreting, they get rid of disorder. But the problem is that the neighboring system has to absorb that disorder. And so how do you manage disorder among systems? Is again, when Shannon, our Shannon, not Claude Shannon, was talking about the different things, the different characteristics, that's the neighbors, good neighbors, when they bang into each other in terms of their creating anomalies for each other's expectations, manage the anomalies instead of just w winning over each other. So anyway, just a couple yeah. of things there. Thank you, Scott. Blue, Sarah, Alex, Marco. So I'm going to skip over what Scott just said and go back to what Marco had, had previously said about um, the connections right between active inference and Eastern religion. So I'm a st student of Buddhism for many years, and I, I've been wondering, right, do we in fact have free will like if we're considering karma and also considering active inference so this is something that like i i find this parallel like karmically we're connected we've got collective karma with groups with systems with you know the universe right in, in this in this uh philosophy so and then we have our own karma like our previous actions and and um you know have have collected collectively formed us right and so when we're faced with a choice, like, like I wonder, do we in fact have free will? Because all we can really do is like, if we're just the product of our karma, we, we only have one choice. Like it's the choice that we're going to make, but obviously that's the only choice that we could have made because of all of our previous karma, right? So, so and in the same way in active inference, in thinking about active inference as um, like a computational, uh, from a computational aspect, if this is really representative of you know, the brain and how, how we think and how, you know, we operate and how we make decisions. So thinking about active inference, there's really only one decision that we could make, right? Like given the inputs, the sensory inputs, and like we have this generative model, like given our model and given the inputs of the system and our selected policy, there's really only one choice that can be made, like as a result of all of this, like collective computation going forward. Anyway, it's just something I've been thinking about for a while. 
Blue, it's it's awesome, and I just checked on Search Engine. Karma as multi-scale Bayesian prior. The title is not taken yet, so anybody who wants to write that one, go for it. Sarah, Alex Kiefer, then Marco. Um, yeah, just more random into the mix, I guess. But um, you know, I was I was reading about like early Babylonian. Um, I don't even know if it was philosophers, but somebody you know said, "Oh, those guys, those guys weren't scientists um, because X, Y, Z." And um, of course, I I disagreed. Uh, but I was just thinking about just generally the um, evolution of of science and math, um, and there just seems to be this constant like bifurcation, bifurcation, and kind of contrasting this ever more complex ecosystem to the fact that we're um, really diminishing our, like we're, we're going through species extinction in the actual material world, but in the model world, we're going through this, this proliferation. And that just like totally trips me out. Like what does it all mean in terms of um, connecting those two things? I, I, I often think about the informational versus material and uh, mourn the loss of, um, I mourn the loss of analog, actually. Like, this is a big thing for me, and I don't quite know where to go with it. But um, it, at some point when things became digitized, we really did decouple um, behavior from material in a way that I think is really significant, but I can't quite get my head around where it matters and where to, where to uh, cut at the joint. I love that phrase. Um, and how to, how to explore that. So if anybody has advice about that also. Um, but yeah. Thanks, Sarah. It's like Marshall McLuhan's work and other media theorists on the innovation of the written word as one kind of uncoupling. And you're hinting at even beyond the written word, there's a digital uncoupling and how that influences us. And especially just you captured it so well, there's a diminishing biological diversity in some ways as we modify our environments. But at the same time, at least over historical time periods, we're proliferating. There's more songs, there's more scientific theories, there's all these types of things. But what happens if we reduce our uncertainty about the biological world till it's just something that can't support that kind of theoretical proliferation? Alex Kiefer, then Marco, then Scott. Oh man, um, really interesting stuff going on here. So, I mean, I originally raised my hand just because I wanted to explicitly say that I do appreciate Marco's um, by connecting this stuff to Buddhism and things like that. Um, that's something that like, I hope to write about once I've established myself as a serious philosopher of science type person enough that then I can say things about that and no one will react badly. Um, Cause I think it's awesome. Um, but, and, and this issue you're bringing up now with like, we're kind of enriching the model space at the expense of the physical world is really deep and important. I don't know what to say about it, but it's there. <laughs> um, and, uh, Yeah, um, I, that's uh, the thing that I was that I wanted to bring up. I figured since we're all talking nicely and getting along about this, these big, you know, interesting large scale themes that maybe um, what we should do is instead argue about like some detailed annoying thing. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, so I just wanted to push um, this idea that so the reason that I that I don't see the FEP as innocent of representation is just this might this might be a sort of because of my provincial view of what representation is, but I figure if you think of a mathematical model as like a structure, right? And then we can, sure, you have different windows in that structure depending on like the the actual mathematical language you use to write symbols down, but maybe this presupposes mathematical realism in some sense, but like you've got a structure if you've got any system of equations. And then on my view, that just represents whatever is isomorphic to that structure. And it could be like a idealized physical system. I don't know. You could argue about applications and where applications come in, but I, I guess I don't see like how you can escape um, representation. Um, so I'll see what, what, what that does if I say that. Yep. And the uh, infamous representation wars earlier on active streams. Marco, then Scott, then anyone else who wants to raise their hand. Thanks. Um... Uh, I'll try to address a lot of points and hopefully it's meaningful. Um, so I didn't catch everything what you said, Scott, but 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 I, I fully agree that there's this huge, hugely important issue of, of dealing with externalities, right? So so I, I have some issue with saying that we simply uh, throw disorder out in the world. Uh, I think that's maybe a consequence of taking the notion of uh, exuding entropy a bit too uh, oversimplified. Entropy isn't strictly disorder. 
um, because as has been noted, it's all about actually almost pretty much, yeah, every information theoretic measure is subjective. It needs to be relative to something, something often forgotten, but re-emphasize invasionism and now also machine learning because they're discovering that it's a huge issue. Anyways, so the point is that, that, that um, first of all, I want to also let you know that, that amongst research and active influence, this is indeed something that's being addressed, right? There's, for me, one of the most exciting applications of active influence is kind of the philosophy of society or a philosophy of how we engage with each other in the world and how I like to say it, and Bryce Huber also took that word, I think, of co-regulation. We regulate each other. So I wouldn't say that, that we intrinsically exude disorder in the colloquial sense. It's more about the basic notion of active influence. You know, you, you perceive something, you do something. The question is, to what extent is that problematic? Do the changes that you enact in the world lead to undesirable consequences? That's the only question, really. Um, but indeed, we can't really address the question systematically, in my opinion, without a framework such as active influence. And until then, we will be myopic. Until then, we will take these externalities for granted and have to wait. And we're at the mercy of our discovery when it becomes too problematic, such as what we saw with Industrial Revolution. Great, great progress in the terms that you care about. Then way later, you find out the consequences, the catastrophic consequences uh, of the externalities at the point then Industrial Revolution uh, ignored. Um, but, you know, we're working on it. Um, and a, a small side point to add to that is um, having said that that our exuding of entropy is not problematic in itself, it uh, comes also with a re-emphasis on how the entropy we exude are actually really great. Think of children, you know, those children are still learning, they've taken all this stuff they don't understand, and they just express so much chaos, but we love it. It stimulates us, it apparently nurtures us, you know, people get happy when they see children playing. Um, and partly because, I think, uh, when people are doing this chaotic what a chaotic, uh, weird, messy behavior in the real world, we're able to kind of understand what's behind that. And I think that's quite a beautiful way to look at it because then you can also see that uh, what may be messy random uh, behavior for some person might be perceived as something stimulating, nurturing, nourishing. Uh, so, so there's a nice kind of ecology going on there. Um, and, and as for blue, about free will, so I, I, I hate the notion of free will mostly used in philosophy because it seems, it almost always seems like free from determinism, right? And, and I think that's, that's, that's already a trap that you cannot fall into. Instead, it's more about autonomy, right? The, the behavior that you, that you engage in, the actions that you, that, you, that you make, to what extent are they driven by factors that are your own? Factors that are more internal rather than external. And then, of course, you would get the problem of, oh, well, we don't have a self, nothing's truly really internal. Sure, but okay, then, then that is simply because that which is internal is also cultivated by something external. But that doesn't take away the fact, I think, that we can say when there's a generative process, to what extent is that due to idiosyncratic factors, um, which I think is beautiful because a lot of these idiosyncratic factors are cultivated in part by our engagement with other people other cultural artifacts. And so our cultivation of culture, of narratives, of interactions with each other, our practices, our rituals, these are all uh, participating to cultivate this collective kind of autonomy. To what extent can we as a collective uh, shape the world, niche construct the world uh, in a way that's more adaptive to us as an agent on multiple skills? Um, so, so also, I actually don't, don't really like the notion of discrete choices, but more a fluid navigation. Imagine you have a conscious, you have a conscious being, space that which is conscious, you're more fluidly navigating um, the density and it expresses itself maybe as a choice. But I think that too is the real kind of reification we talked about earlier. Um, so yeah, not to go too long on that. Um, yeah, and also really like the notion of uh, this uncoupling. So for me, with the danger, is kind of, uh, to use a word used earlier, um, there's this autocatalytic power to some uh, narrative, to some practices, which shifts uh, the, the, the fitness of these practices to a more overly pragmatic mode of behavior. One other way I wanna, wanna describe this is basically a lot of our digital technologies create a training set that is too decoupled from the actual test set that we will encounter in the world. Um, what you see in the kind of rise of 
some people might know the notion of meat space and cyber space. When you live in cyber space, you're being attuned to a world that isn't conforming to the meat space. And I think exactly that is a danger. And I fully agree with that, even though I'm much, very much an ancient denizen. I do think that this is a problem that hasn't been fully addressed, is dangerous. And the fact that we can't, with all these smart people here, that we can't formulate it properly or characterize it properly is another indication that this deserves more attention. Um, yeah, so thanks, thanks for all the Marco. stimulating thoughts. Scott, and then anyone else who raises their hand. So a small fun point and then a big um, fun point. So the small fun point is, Mar Marco, you're talking about children throwing off wildness and entropy, and that's recreational disorder, right? Because you know that there's a thing there. It, there's two points on that one. One, hot sauce is another one of those, right? Because it's, it's uncomfortable, but people like it, right? And so on that, there's actually a physical, there was an article in Nature, this is a small fun point, uh, article in Nature magazine that in your senses of taste, there are five senses, right? There's actually two channels, good and bad. The good channel is sweet, which is carbohydrates, and umami, which is proteins. The bad channel is bitter and sour, which are poisons, typically, and unripe fruit. And so salt doesn't have its own channel. Salt goes from the good channel until a level of blood salinity and then switches to the bad channel. So the reason for mentioning that is in food, you use bitter and sour as highlights, as recreational disorder, right? And so they're, and they're because they're not indicative usually of consumables in nature. So that was just an interesting sidelight on that. It's a similar to this notion in the dentist. There's this research now that if you have a very painful dental procedure, you should actually finish up the procedure with a little extra pain but not, but a, a soreness type pain, not a difficult pain, because the m mind remembers the last pain experienced. So the, uh, the the article said, "Do you want a little pain with that?" And the idea was extra irritant. And the ADA said they can't because of the do no harm. They can't administer extra pain as a matter of policy. But the idea was to hijack the sensation, the memory of the bad experience with a lesser pain which is kind of interesting. So that, that was those are small fun points. Let me get to the bigger point, which I think um, is uh, goes back to what Sarah was um, alluding to. So this is that idea of symbolic and physical beings, okay? And this is something I've been playing with for a little while. It takes a short period to describe, and so let me try that. So what if, put, put aside all your notions of causation for a minute. I'm going to go back to something that Seth Lloyd raised for me, a guy at MIT who wrote Programming the Universe. And he asserted in his book that all interactions since the Big Bang have increased exponentially, all interactions in the universe. Okay? So two, two particles hit each other, then they hit four particles, hit 16 particles, whatever. And then that iterates out to us. Okay? So Moore's Law you have this exponential increase in transistor density on chips that has led the fifth order effect of that to an exponential increase in human interactions. Okay, because the chips are more ubiquitous, they can digitize more interactions. We're having this discussion now is not possible before. Okay, so the more interactions are happening exponentially. Let's go with that for a second, suspend disbelief, and just imagine that all interactions are increasing exponentially. Okay. What happened with humans is physical space did not offer enough um, uh, vectors of uh, engagement to contain interactions increasing exponentially. And so we had to go to symbolic space. So there were a couple of, a couple of other, I'll get back to that in a second. So think of clonal reproduction versus um, sexual reproduction. Clonal reproduction, you resemble your parents. And for niche space, and again, this is not intelligent design, but stay with me. Um, for niche space, clones are not sufficiently varied so that if the niche space is changing rapidly, the clones won't have as much survivability. Mutation, random mutations can introduce that noise that can allow the accommodation of that change in physical space. I think what's happening with humans is that we are becoming information beings increasingly. And I say that to people and they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I say, hey, you know that 401k that you have? If anybody has any retirement savings, the I say to them, do you think that's a pile of groceries or, or a house waiting for you to retire? That is data. That is nothing. The system goes, you got nothing. It's totally symbolic. So one of the, if, if and to the extent that interactions have in, and their artifacts are increasing exponentially throughout 
time, through our deep time, it was inevitable that we move to information space because the the phase space available for solutions to our problems was insufficient in physical space. We needed more dimensionality in order to address things. And that's what language does for us. It opens up dimensions. It opens up abstractions. It opens up things called war. It opens up things called stock markets. It opens up things called insurance, law, governance, all these things that allow for us to be human. And the thing that separates us from other organisms to some extent is that language is where the mind exists because that's the symbolic element of who we've become as information beings. So there's a lot there, but I think one of the things that's been, I've, I've been playing with, just trying to understand what this might be, is what does it mean to be converted increasingly to information beings? And not, we're not still have a physical presence, but for, this came up first, and last point here, this came up first in the identity work I did years ago, where people were saying, oh, you can't control me on the internet. I said, sure you can. A government, a sovereign, can put you to death. They have the monopoly of legitimized violence, or they can silence you, which is we've seen happen now. And so the physical body, if I die right now while I'm talking, which some people might like with this long thing I'm saying here, if, if I died right now, immediately my legal agency to do things on the internet would change. And it's an entanglement. It's almost like a quantum entanglement because it would happen instantaneously. I cannot have agency if I'm dead. So anything pre-programmed in my, phys in my symbolic self could keep running, but the physical world then doesn't respect you as having a, a, a will anymore. <laughs> so there is an entanglement. So as long as governments continue to control the physical body and have the monopoly of legitimated violence, they can control the digital body because putting you to death de-animates the, it, in, um, in the uh, digital body. Enough. Thank you, Scott. And we have uh, Dave, then Sarah, then Stephen, and we'll steer it back to the paper and also get towards the last thoughts that each person wants to share. So again, Dave, Sarah, Stephen, and then anyone else. Okay. The, um, when the kids make a lot of chaos, uh, you look at, at the, the especially one-on-one -on -one games that kids do, they are largely dominance games. One kid is going to tend to monopolize being the, the dominant figure, the cowboy, the sheriff, for a while, and then switch back. Now, if they hang with that role for more, uh, more than about 60% of the time, eventually it gets actually almost sadistic, and it becomes too aggressive. The little and it, things get out of hand. The dominated kid cries, runs off. The smart mommy just kind of gives them a little pat and lets the kids go on their way. The overprotective mom, though, almost takes over the bullying and makes it a terrible thing, which means the kids can't go back and achieve restoration. So when the, when the, the child who has been paranoid doesn't have the reassurance that, oh, well, okay, the world does eventually become okay. And the kid who's been in the sadistic infantile mode doesn't get the reassurance. Well, even if I was evil mommy for a while, I'm not evil mommy anymore. Now I'm good mommy. So another reason to let your kids whack, whack on each other and get dirty. And okay, thank you. Whack. Sarah, Stephen, and then anyone else? Oh, um, Scott's comment kind of reminded me of what I, what I unconsciously was bridging. Um, with respect to, to information, um, Scott said something I, verbatim, I don't remember, but basically that um, something about language. And for me, you know, language, uh, languages, as with ecosystems, as with um, species extinction, like languages are going extinct. And so languages are a really interesting bridge to this, you know, information space. Um, and it seemed to, the, that fact of languages going extinct seems to contradict something you said, Scott, but Again, because this is, I feel like Mel's show, I want Mel to like hook this into whatever she's working on, if, if that makes sense for her. S Steven, Tim, then Mel, or anyone else? Steven, muted. 
All right. Okay. Sorry, sorry. I'm really, I, I was just trying. I was looking for a paper that I was trying to find on something. But it's okay. Um. So what what I was going to say is that um. There's 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 a lot of stuff coming up here that sort of um. And I, one thing I like about this paper is it 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 sort of starts from the free energy principle and sort of really pays attention to that and the active inference. And I think that there is something important, like because we get into this conversations about information and stuff. Is is like the free energy principle is a colliery for active inference at these stages and different scales. And then once that scaling is happening, there's also a free energy principle that sort of scales up anyway, the, the natural nature of how these, these societies try to work with these models. And there's a paper that was, I think, in the Physics Review of Life, and I'm trying to find it, but it, it sort of talked about how we naturally try and reduce free energy over time. And I think this is particularly what's happened since capitalism in the last 500 years or 200 years particularly, is we want to reduce, or there's a tendency in different ways to try and reduce the amount of free energy out there. And we can do it more and more because we can construct, and our, our, our focus is constructing um, these um, larger scale um, society, social networks, ecosystems, a super organism, as uh, Mel talks about it. And we're, we're kind of, we're, we're sort of constructing this niche to such an extent that we just take that for granted. And these perspectives on things and the rarefication is almost um, de facto. But there's also probably more traditionally in history, and it's probably also true if you think like, what do you do when you're out in the middle of the ocean? You can't control the ocean. So now you have to try and adapt whatever the winds are doing based on what you've got. So this also that that sort of comes back to that idea of um, the organism, like as an active influence process to try and minimise free energy and just to stay attuned and alive in a niche um, is is something that the sort of very foundational understanding from physics and chemistry sort of still alludes to you know and then we have these higher the, the, this ability to construct through action and um and this is where we can start to feel that these actions that we do like we're talking about that we are information but this is this is the danger of the rarefication of information because we at some extent because we've built on top of things, yeah, we kind of construct things in our niche, which makes it, and it is kind of an informational hold in our niche, but we're still a being that has to um, dynamically engage with that niche. And that information doesn't travel, like, unlike in traditional and activism, that information doesn't come in as like, that's a tree. It comes in again in amongst all this noisy um, statistical variations, and we infer from that. So there's this question about that danger that information starts to get rarefied and is and is and, and, and becomes seen as something being transmitted down the channel. But that's only something that effectively emerges once some processing is done. So I think I think you know that's that's what sort of came up for me. Thank you, Stephen. So in our last couple of minutes, we will go to Tim, Marco, and then anyone else. So let's just keep it brief and summary. And remember that next week in 14.2, we're going to be on the same paper. So no need to cram it in in the last minute, maybe raise some questions or ask somebody about their perspective so that we can mull on it in the next week and then come back next week with the links ready and with the ideas ready, with the questions ready and read the paper another time. So Tim, Marco, and then anyone else. Yeah, just uh, briefly, uh, uh, the child's play. I, I, maybe it's obvious, and it's like what everybody already knows about things. But uh, it struck me when you were talking about it that that's kind of like active inference on hyperdrive, right? Because the, the the child's play is this, you know, generating these fanciful hypotheses. You know, like the imagination is just going, and then that puts them in a position to enact with interact with the world and maximize surprisal as they run all over the place and trip over things, right? So it's like it's learning on hyperdrive 
And then the only other thing I want to say is wrapping up was as I was going through and reading the paper and all those uh, attempts to answer the question, what is the free energy principle in terms of a category? There was one uh, kind of startling reductive idea that came to mind. It seemed really silly, but I'll throw it out there. It, could it just be like an idealization, like frictionless? You know, because um, it's, con it's compared to the... Um, uh principle of least action right but but if you look at the actual free energy principle through the layers of, st of, of statistical mechanics like all those layers going into that uh kind of translation uh the free energy principle almost just seems like since we can't really see all that through all that cloudiness of statistical and probability and such and uh, um it seems like just an idealization a way to say we can do something with this even though it's this distant thing that's gone through this probability machine but we can do things with it because we have this idealization that we call the free energy principle so it's just another another option for your what it is thing maybe it seems silly i don't know yep mel then marco yeah so so interestingly um we've had we've had in, in philosophy of science we've had series of how science works for a long time and we've gone through <laughs> many kinds of uh, popular accounts, kind of mainstream accounts of how science works. And um, these have traditionally emphasized um, theories um, and, and accuracy, right? You want, you want, you want a, an accurate, true representation of, of what's going on in nature, right? Um, but uh and, and falsification this sort of thing um the the kind of en vogue view right now the 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 idea du jour is is really in, in a lot of ways focusing on models focusing on idealization focusing on pluralism um there are a lot of great books on this um michael weisberg's simulation and similarity fantastic book great introduction to models some of the big debates and models. Um, Stephen Downs has a new, like, tiny little just introduction that just gives you a breakdown of all the literature and models. And um, uh, Angela Potochnik in my department has a fantastic book called Idealization and the Aims of Science. And then, um, I, so I, what was funny to me is I, I wrote this paper, I wrote this paper, and then the, the math is not the territory. And then a few weeks later, someone, um, uh, a professor in my department, in fact, in my department, announced that they were running a course uh, for the spring term um, on on this new book by uh, Robin Winter called "When Maps Become the World," which is actually a fantastic book. I'm really enjoying this book, um, and it's touching on all of these things that you guys have been talking about, like kind of different modes of representing and do these things represent or not, and and how um, the kind of feedback between our maps of the world and like cultural differences and how we how we represent things and um, where the world is going these, these kinds of kind of big picture questions and it's, it's a really lovely read um, the idea with with models right is that what they do is chiefly idealized right um, if if you look at like the 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 whim fact um, the one side account of, of, of what's going on in modeling, right? The idea is that um, it, it's not meant to be a maximally accurate depiction of some natural system or some natural process. Um, it's, it's not its fidelity to the world that makes the model useful. But in fact, it's the idealization. It's what gets coarse-grained, black box away. You know, it's, it's, it's it's about finding it's about latching on to some kind of key feature of the system of interest, and that's always mediated by kind of what our what our questions are as researchers, what our interests are in these natural systems of research. So it's kind of value laden in a way, um, and it's discarding the rest. It's discarding the information that is inessential to the question at hand. So so idealization is at the core of what a model is. Awesome response. So any very rapid final words? This is the true lightning round. Marco, Scott, Alex Kiefer. Oh dear, I'm not good at lightning rounds. Um, 
Uh, well, okay, very brief. So, so I agree about the importance of inertia friction, but I do think it's already, uh, it, it, you get it for free, like Carl likes to say. You get it for free with active inference, I think, because you have two situations where I think you will get friction. One is pathologically stuck when you're overly rigid because there's no alternatives of, of sufficient credence, the base factor is too high, so you can move out of it, right? So it, instead of saying there's a presence of friction, it's more like there's an absence of a lubricant or something, or an absence of a passive. And the other side, if you have too many possibilities, your base factor can get too high because everything's kind of similar, so you get stuck in that. Uh, and I think for me, those are two forms of friction slash inertia. Um, I just very briefly want to wrap up that big theme of how we scaffold all these things upon society, which is abstraction upon abstractions, and the many, many dangers that lie there, um, where indeed you would have, I think, an autocatalytic uh, pitfall of, of um, trying to cope with the complexity of the world, but falling into heuristics. And when these heuristics are used to minimize your experience uh, uh, consequences of excessive free energy, uh, and then adopt that heuristic, then it will spread in this kind of self-selecting manner, as in the people exposed to these notions, such as, for example, QAnon conspiracies, they heuristically connect everything together, and so you seemingly experience coherence as long as you don't stick too far or commit to proper aesthetic virtues. Um, and, and indeed, this will become worse and worse unless we have an alternative, a better ground, at least in my opinion. Um, and I do want to push back a little bit on this uh, mostly true claim that, that, that models are just idealization. But I think what's really, really interesting is not just models as presented in papers, models as defined in maths, but take into account the human enterprise that is science, because everyone has to adopt this model, not just program it in some code. Way more interesting is what happens when you adopt or incorporate or internalize an idealized model. And for me, that's the expressiveness back of inference. Upon incorporating it, you will de-idealize it. You will fill it up. You will uh, make it your own particular. And, and that expressiveness, in my opinion, is what makes it an interesting and what Mel has really laid the groundwork for, in my opinion. But yeah, Thanks. I wish we could have talked more about the paper. <laughs> Thanks, Marco. Again, it's dot two. It's not about answering every question in the dot one or even the dot two. It's about staying excited about including as many people in the conversation, hearing from everybody's perspective. If you're curious and listening, joining the key base, actinflab.public is a great way to get engaged with action, not just inference. So again, single kind of closing thoughts, but less personal review paper, my TED talk, but more, what are we gonna move forward <laughs> to into 14.2? Not that anyone did that. Scott, Alex Kiefer, Stephen Sled. The painter Kandinsky said that violent societies yield abstract art and one of the things i always wondered is is the reverse also true is abstraction a form of violence and so that's something i i posit to you that 2008 financial break was abstraction of mortgage instruments that caused a violence of people who were kicked out of their homes the math, so, the math of the mortgage was not the territory of the lived experience yep. and the need for housing. And so that yep. is where so the disconnect happened. So something to be aware of in terms of abstraction and the possibility of it being a form of violence. And the monopoly of legitimated violence being a definition of the sovereign from Mills, you might think about the monopoly of legitimated abstraction being a form of sovereignty. Thanks. Thank you, Scott. Alex Kiefer, Stephen, and then Sarah. Um, so one thing I'm still interested in talking about, um, potentially next week is, I guess this probably is like a microcosm of some of the stuff we've talked about, but, um, sort of the Jamesian perspective in, in thermodynamics and in physics and how this relates to all this, um, because, um, I think there's potentially something interesting. So I, one thing I like about this paper, I will be brief here. One thing I like is that it goes through sort of the history of the formalism of the FEP and where it came from. And I think in part that's meant to cast doubt on the, any direct connection between um, the FEP and physics. But at the same time, the Jamesian perspective in physics is something the FEP inherits from and that sort of already maybe gets epistemic stuff into physics at a lower low level. So I want to talk about the relationship between um, entropy in the thermodynamic sense and entropy in the Shannon sense, if we have a chance. Thank you. We're going to go to Mel. Um, with uh, first author privilege. And then again, anyone can drop off if they need to go, but let's bring it to a close together. Otherwise, Mel, Stephen, Sarah. Yeah, I actually, um, 
I, I would really love to talk about that point that you raised. Um, and my other reviewer, I know who it is. <laughs> they signed it. Um, my other reviewer, uh, Andrew Corcoran, actually, great guy, um, raised that there's this new paper um, by Gottwald and Brown, published December 3rd, 2020, that is in computational biology um and it's uh it's it's really getting into james so it's, it's really getting into free energy it's really getting into the jamesian perspective it's like the first it's like the first time anyone has really delved into james and the fep um so i'd love to discuss that because i haven't i haven't read it um yet and i'd love to discuss that Thank oh, you. Is that, is that Julian Janes? Which Janes is that? No, no, no E.T. Janes. So, so okay, maximum, thank you. maximum entropy principle. I can, I can drop this link in the in the comments as well. And I'd also love to talk about representation, yes. like different different approaches to representation and how models represent, if they do necessarily. Excellent, Stephen. And I'll go back to just my regular camera. Stephen, go ahead, and then anyone else. Yeah, I think that I would like to hear more on that, uh, James, the entropy, the maximum entropy approach. I think the whole entropy, ergodic thing is really interesting. I think that's what this paper, like I say, is really tapping into that. And uh, and I suppose one thing I'd like to say is we talk about models, is um, we're using models to get the dynamics. And there's this slight trap because, well, that makes sense. Um, but you have to take a perspective and rare, rarefy it. And it's like this modern world, we just do it. But the, the key thing that's also present with the whole flows of information is an, a, a, is that your models can reveal other ways of knowing which are not perspectival and are not themselves the model. So the interesting thing about dropping something out of an active inference model isn't the model, it's the dynamic shifts that the graphs show when the model's running. So... That, and that can tap into indigenous ways of knowing because the thing with indigenous people, as I was saying earlier, is that they're trying to attune to the world, not say what the world is and model it. And that maybe is what we need to do more to actually survive on this planet as it's in the ecological collapse because we might need to sense what is it that we need to dynamically embody that isn't entirely modelable. So anyway, we could talk about that. That's enough for me. Yes. Sarah, did you have something? Okay, Marco, any last thought? I just want to um, echo what's been said by Mel and uh, Alex. I also think that one of the most interesting things, especially for the next session, to talk more about the relation between thermodynamic and information theoretic entropy, especially because there's one sentence in Mel's that I just want to point out. So it says, the elements of the framework do not map onto any known features of real-world systems, at least not with any more granularity or specificity than the cause of dynamics of such systems. But I found that a very strange sentence because it seems that the granularity or specificity of their cause of dynamics would be sufficient to act as a model, right? And I think the, the really, really interesting thing that hasn't been explored enough, but, but Mel gives a good uh, uh, starting ground for is asking more about the relation between entropic and thermo uh, sorry, thermodynamic and information theoretic entropy, where I think we should maybe move more or emphasize the, the perspective of interpreting entropy as distribution, right? how flat, how homogeneous, how distributed is it? As it tends to be to kind of flat out, to spread out at, in the thermodynamic sense. And then I think it, with that conceptual metaphor, it's not really a metaphor, it's just true, but with that concept in mind, I think it's much easier to have a conversation about the relationship between information theoretic and thermodynamic entropy. That being said, looking forward to a forwarding point two. Thanks so much, Mel. Any last thoughts as the first and last author otherwise i'll close it out phenomenal thank you this was great yep it's great to be all. mel thanks so much for not just the paper but for engaging with us you know asynchronously on twitter and synchronously on video chat all of the participants there was so much we brought up today and it was just awesome to hear what everyone had to share so if you're listening live or in replay you're part of the community of practice and we want to just have you participate, however. So if you're curious about something, post a question. If you want to know how you can participate, just reach out to us through any number of these mechanisms. Other than that, on January 26th, we will be right back here for 14.2.
and we'll deal with some of these questions. Everybody will come with a few new digested thoughts, a couple of polished questions, and we will go from there. So thanks again, everybody, and we'll see you next week.